Thank you again, Annette. If you have your Bibles with you, if you'll turn to the Gospel of John, the sixth chapter. We'll be reading together verses 66 through 71, beginning in the 66th verse. Because of this, many of his disciples turned back and no longer went about with him. So Jesus asked the twelve, Do you also wish to go away? Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom can we go? You have the words to eternal life. We have come to believe and know that you are the Holy One of God. And Jesus answered them, Did I not choose you, the twelve, yet one of you is a devil? He was speaking of Judas, Simon, son of Simon Iscariot, for he, though one of the twelve, was going to betray him. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. John Purdy in his book, uh, Returning God's Call, The Challenge of Christian Living, actually suggests that the metaphors that we use for the Christian life are are outdated and really aren't understood anymore. He points out that these old metaphors that you've probably all heard, that they've been beneficial for a while and they were important, but now they really don't touch us anymore, such as metaphors such as a soldier in God's army or a scholar in the school of Christ or a traveler along the Christian way or, or a citizen in the commonwealth and even a member of Christ's body. He said all of these metaphors were powerful and, and they played an important role in the past, but they're just not as useful today. The metaphor that he recommends and and actually argues for through the whole book is the words hearer of God's call. His rationale is this. It's the image of all of us who have heard and keep hearing God's call in our life is that persistent call that brings us from belief into action. Therefore, we are hearers of the call. Now, whether you agree with Purdy or not, that reality, those words, that hearer of the call, I think are important reminders that we are faithful disciples. Here's how he describes it in life. He says, as a child, I would go out and and, and play with all the other children in the neighborhood, and one of our favorite games during the summer was hide-and-go-seek. You know, I'm sure some of you have experienced that, those moments right before dark, you know, before it gets so dark you can't see, but but it's dark enough where you can hide in all the shadows. And he said, as we would all be gathered there playing, he said, I would hear the front door open in my mother's voice as she called me, John, it's time for you to come in. He said, now, often, as a child, I would sort of ignore her voice that call to come in and continue to play hide and go seek. He said, if somebody on the street walked by, I looked just like all the other children there on the street playing hide and go seek. But he said, from that moment on, I was different. See, I had been called, so I was set apart. Therefore, we as hearers of the call have been called and everything has changed. I don't know about you, but I I really like that expression, hearers of the call. The disciples heard the call, and they responded to Jesus' call. And as followers of Jesus, as disciples, we are also hearers of the call. We have heard the call of Christ to follow, and we continue to hear that call daily. See, it's not just a once in a lifetime experience or or decision that we make one time and then we go forward. It is a continual call that comes to us each and every day. And I think our text for today makes this point powerfully. See, some of Jesus' followers, did you hear it in that first 
verse were struggling with his teaching. As a matter of fact, they found it so difficult that, that some of them had decided that, that they cannot accept it anymore, so they go away. Now, for us to understand this mass, mass exodus in, in John 6, I, I think we need to go all the way back through the whole chapter. So you've got to know that in the beginning of the chapter, Jesus is the feeding of 5,000. You've heard that story before, right? Where he takes five loaves and two fish and feeds 5,000 and, and there are 12 baskets full of food. And, and they ate their field. They, they were filled. They were so excited that day that they ate their field. They about were, were ready to take Jesus by force and make him king because he had multiplied the loaves and the fishes and he had fed them. So they have followed him everywhere he's gone. They cross the, the lake coming to find him again and they walk up basically wanting more food. So Jesus now knowing what they're looking for confronts them with the fact that you are following me not because you have heard what I've taught, but you are following me only because I met your immediate needs and worked a marvelous miracle. You know, and, and that just opens the door for them to kind of interchange. You know, you know how it is when you're caught doing something you shouldn't, you, you immediately want to change the subject. So, what do they do? They immediately want to talk about the signs and how they're looking for signs. And, and, and they say, well, now, Jesus, Moses, in the wilderness, gave our forefathers and mothers food every day. But Jesus quickly reminds them that it was not Moses that gave them food. But it was the Father in heaven who gave them the manna from heaven. And it's the Father who gives us true bread from heaven. And when they hear it, they respond, Sir, give us this bread always. And then Jesus makes this wonderful claim. You've heard it before. I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never be hungry. And whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. Well, guess what that did? That just opened the door for, for more questions Are, uh, around that image of manna in the wilderness. And, and Jesus has finally had enough. And he looks at the crowd and says, those who eat my flesh and drink my blood have eternal life. And I will raise them up on the last day. This is the bread that has come down from heaven. Not like that which your ancestors ate and they died, but the one who eats this bread will live forever. Those words are hard for the crowd to hear. You know, for us, it's okay because we understand communion and, and we kind of get the imagery, but imagine hearing that for the first time. You're basically going to be cannibals. You're going to eat my flesh. You're going to drink my blood. And, and, and there it is. And, and, and I'm telling you that, that I am the very life of God who has come from heaven. And if anyone is going to have eternal life, then you are going to have to accept it, submit to it. Jesus has become very clear here. The call to of discipleship was a difficult call. It's a call that demands us and them to make Jesus the master of your life. To make him our number one priority. And some of the crowd couldn't take it. They had to turn away. You know, as a preacher, I, I think this is, I say this is the worst chapter in the Bible because it's awful as the pastor to see church members walk away. In over 30 years, I've seen it happen. So, so I can relate to Jesus as, it, as he stands there and, 
and, and there he is kind of looking over his shoulder, and, and we're talking a mass exodus, thousands leaving. And as they are walking off over the hill, I almost hear a pain in Jesus' voice as he turns to the 12, his closest friends, his circle, and he says, will you? Or do you also wish to go away? In other words, it's time for you to choose, guys. Are you going to accept me or reject me? Do you also wish to go away? Now, I can also relate to the crowd that's walking away because whether we admit it or not, I think we've all wrestled with that question. Oh, we may not have verbalized it when we said, you know, I want to turn away from Jesus, but deep within our souls, there's been that temptation that we all face. As a matter of fact, some of us may be facing it at this very moment. You know, it may be the temptation to turn away because things are not going the way you plan. You thought accepting Jesus and everything would be great and wonderful in life and all of a sudden it's not as peachy and and clean as it used to be and and things are hard and and there's a struggle and, and you're just not as happy as you wanted to so you want to turn and run. Maybe your marriage that you've worked so hard for, the marriage that you and your spouse stood before God and made a commitment to follow that covenant is now falling apart. Maybe one of your children has gone off the rails or off the deep end. Or or maybe your spouse or a loved one or a friend. Or or maybe you've just found out that your job is falling apart. And and all of those moments, it's falling away. And you just don't know what to do. So you turn and run. We've all seen that temptation. Whatever it is, it's not new. See, I think the big reason that so many people face this life of what I call discipleship dropouts. You know, the people that join the church one Sunday and then you don't see them again for two years. You know, the first big reason for that is Jesus' claims are pretty unique. I mean, he claims to be the bread of life. I know the source of any meaning that that any of us are going to have. You know, some folks simply can't follow along with that. And they can't certainly follow along with words like denying ourselves, giving unto the least of these, taking up our cross, humble ourselves, live clean and holy lives? You know, Jesus' claims are unique. Jesus' claims tempt us all at times to drop out. Or or maybe it's another reason, what I call that crowd mentality, you know, where everybody else in the crowd is doing it, or everybody's doing it, so why don't we? Is that simply we can't resist the crowd. We, we, the crowd's going in one direction and, and it's away from the church and, and we're tired of swimming up river, so we just jump in and go with them. You know, it's people dropping out of church because I love it. They show up five minutes late and they leave five minutes early, but they say, that's the unfriendliest church I've ever, I've ever seen. Or, or they sure are snobbish or, or they're too big or too small or too laid back. Okay, I know, that's enough on temptations. We've got that down. Let's just recognize that temptations are real and kind of leave it there. Obviously, Jesus believed temptations were real. If he didn't believe it, he was watching it walk walk over the hill as a large portion of his crowd had turned their backs and were leaving. And then he turns to his friends. Will you also go away? See, I want you to catch it. This is a defining moment for Peter. 
when he responds to this question, he defines what's ahead. You know, I almost imagine that Peter's got tears in his eyes there. They're running down his face. He, he's kind of like I'm doing. He shifts back and forth from foot to foot because he's nervous. The stark terror it, within his soul is just go, is, is driving him crazy. He, he, he really don't want to talk, but, you know, Peter, he's got to speak. So he says, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. Basically, in modern terms, Annette just sang it for you. Peter is saying, give me Jesus. Give me Jesus, Lord. That's all I need. Give me Jesus. That's everything that I need in life. Now, I'm not trying to oversimplify it. Because I believe, and, and I know you do, that Jesus is anything but simple. There's so many multifaceted attributes to his character. You could study Jesus for years and, and still not exhaust the life and ministry that, that is there. But the truth is, amidst the fire, the struggle, the weary journey, all the things that go on in life, all we need is Jesus. And give me Jesus is what will sustain us because he is our rock on which our lives are built. There is no one else that can withstand the struggles of life. Jesus is our constant in an ever-changing, ever-twisting, ever-evolving world. William Barclay actually writes, Peter's loyalty was based on a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. There are many things he did not understand. Peter was just as bewildered and puzzled as everyone else, but there was something about Jesus for which Peter was willing to die. In the last analysis, Christianity is not a philosophy that we accept, nor a theory to which we give allegiance. It is a personal relationship to Jesus Christ. It is the allegiance and the love which a person gives because their heart will not allow them to do anything else. See, if we truly believe in Jesus, if we embrace him, even though he has made all these radical claims, then we must stand beside Peter. And we must proclaim, give me Jesus. Where else can we go? Jesus has the words to eternal life. But you know what? We all know it's one thing to say it. It's another thing to live it. I mean, after all, the Pharisees were masters. And they, they lived by the rules and regulations, but they never put their rules and regulations, their belief into action. So how do we live out our belief? By being obedient to Jesus daily. Now, I know that makes you nervous, doesn't it? Make me nervous all week. But I want you to hear this. Being obedient does not mean perfection. Peter's the perfect example of it. I mean, here Peter is making gr a great statement of faith, standing up in that moment. But in one moment, he makes a great statement of faith. Give him a few more minutes, and he will have his foot in his mouth again, no matter how intent we are on following Jesus. No matter how hard we try to keep on track, we will all fall off track because we are not Jesus see Jesus doesn't expect perfection what he expects is action in the process of hearing you are compelled to take an honest look at your life at the life of your family at the life of your church and not just ask, what is Jesus saying? But really wrestle with the question, what does Jesus call us as hearers of the call 
to do. See, it's good to say we believe, but your belief does not come to life until the rubber meets the road and the rubber meets the road when we put our belief into practice. O.S. Guinness actually wrote, writes, to follow the call of Jesus is therefore to live life before the heart of God. It is to live life coram, coram diem, which means before the heart of God, and thus shifts, shifts our awareness from the audience to the point where only the, where only the last and highest important part of the audience is Jesus himself. See, we are to live our lives before the heart of God being obedient to his word, to his call. And simply put, obedience has nothing to do with perfection. It is hearing the call and acting on it. Andre Nowen says, obedience is, the, it, it is embodying Jesus Christ. It is total listening, giving attention with, hesitation, with no hesitation or limitations of being all ear. When used by Jesus, the word obedient has no association with fear, but rather is the expression of an intimate, loving relationship. Jesus' actions and words are the obedient response to this love of his Father. So obedience means being hearers. Let those who have ears Listen, last time I checked, I think everybody out there has ears. But not all of us listen. Let those who have ears listen and hear my call in their life so that you can follow, respond to that call. You know, that's what it means. Parents, when your children do something that you ask them to do, are they doing it just so you'll be happy? You know, the truth, I, and I was never the best child, so Chris had to pay for my raising, you know, that old say, with our children. And, and, and I would eventually do what I was asked to do. It just, maybe it's a man thing. It'd take a while to do it. You know, I can remember my mother telling us to pick up our rooms and clean our rooms. And you know what? I always would say, yeah, mother, I'll do it. But you know, my ne room was never clean until I finally picked up the clothes and the shirts and the jeans that were laying on the floor and put them away. You know, my obedience to my mother was not because out of some duty. My obedience to my mother was my way of telling her that I did love her. And I think that's the same here. The call of Jesus, being hearers of the call, living that out each and every day, obedience to that call is basically saying to Jesus, I love you. Now, I apologize if you have not seen The Chosen Season 3 all the way through. And I'll say, too bad, you should have watched it by now. Uh, this season has been a hard one for me to watch. You know, I've admitted to the group on Wednesday nights that I can't binge watch that show because it's too emotional. And uh, for some reason, I really struggled with season three. You know, uh, y'all know me well enough to know that Simon Peter is my favorite character of the 12, and Peter is my favorite because he is definitely a character. But I watched during this season Peter struggle with his call. And it killed my soul. Or maybe it just fanned the flames in my soul of my struggles with that call. 
Now, I'm not going to get into all the details, but the basis of the call is Peter had to decide if he wanted Jesus and nothing else or if he wanted the life that he lived before. You know, because his life goes on, sometimes being a follower of Jesus gets in the way of life. And that means family, that means friends, that means business, that means everything. Because if we put it in the proper order, then guess what? Jesus comes first before your family, before your job, before anything else. And Peter has been living that way, and it has become a struggle to the point that Peter is ready to leave, to throw his hands up, say to heck with it all, and go back to the lake. Well, in the last episode, Peter is in the boat with the other disciples and he is going home to quit. He's done. He is not going to be a disciple anymore. He doesn't say that, but you can hear it in his voice. And the storm comes, and oh, does the storm come. And they do a marvelous job with the storm. Here they are, experienced fishermen fighting against the storm, rowing as hard as they can, trying to make the boat move, and the boat is going nowhere. They are stuck right in the middle of the storm, and up walks Jesus. When they see him, they're terrified, just as the Bible tells us. But finally, Peter calls out, says, Lord, if it's you, call me to come to you. And, and Jesus does just that. And Peter gets up in the middle of the storm to get over the side of the boat. And every disciple in the boat is grabbing him. Don't go, Peter. Don't do it. Don't step out. And Peter finally gets away and he jumps over the side of the boat and Peter is walking on water for one step two steps and then he takes his eyes off Jesus and Peter starts to say you know the story and I've always said Peter lets the water get up to about his mouth before he screams Lord help me no in this show the water completely overcomes it And all you see is Peter's hand sticking out of the water. And Peter's drowning. And Jesus reaches his hand out and lifts Peter up. And into the boat they come. And that's when I heard it. When they're in the boat, all you hear is Peter through the tears saying, Jesus, never, ever let me go. Jesus, don't let me go. Never let me go. And Jesus wraps his arms around him and it says, Peter, I will never leave you. I will never let you go. See, it was in that moment Peter realized who he was. And it was in that moment Peter was saying, give me Jesus and nothing else. Now, I don't know what's going to happen now, but I do know what happens Sure, Peter's going to fail, and Peter's going to turn his back on him. Peter's going to deny him. Peter's going to run his way, but you know what? I know how the story ends because one day Peter walked 
with his hands bound towards a cross, the same cross that he had seen Jesus on. And instead of crying out in fear, Peter went forward in joy and his only complaint was don't crucify me the way Jesus did, was crucified because I am not worthy. So they turned him upside down and Peter went on singing, give me Jesus, give me Jesus, and nothing else. And I imagine God smiled as he welcomed him home. See, I believe God is calling us all that we are all hearers of the call. How do you hear God calling you? What is God calling you to do? How is God calling you to be obedient to his call? As Ronnie comes and leads us in our closing hymn, I remind you this altar is open to anyone who would like to come forward and have a word of prayer. The doors of this church are open to anyone who would like to unite with this church as we stand and sing.